So um, yeah, hello and welcome also from my side. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the uh, day so far, the VRNowCon um, for the second time actually. And I want to talk to you a little bit about um, Volumetric Studio. Uh, maybe hands up who knows already Volumetric Studio or Volumetric Video Capturing? So not so many people. Okay, I will try to go not into too much detail but just make a plain overview about it. So I'm from Interlake, um, we are also based in Potsdam, and I want to give you just a little bit of context so why we are doing this, why we're building a volumetric video um, and this use case. So we work with tools and guidance for a lot of industry um, companies uh, since 20 years. And a lot of the time we work with partners. So this is our main focus. We have a lot of partners who are working with new and interesting technologies and we also try to take them, analyze them and using them to the best advantage of the specific customer. I just want to show you this really quick because um, Microsoft, which is displayed there, will be playing a part uh, in this presentation. So um, the reason why we could only do this was because we were one of the, um, or are one of the top 1% partners of Microsoft, and so we were able to make this volumetric capture. For this, for this session, I mainly want to focus on walkable film so that you are able to go into a film, to participate in a movie, in a film, um, and you're able to move freely and not like virtual reality, so you're not shut out of the, of the real physical reality, but you merged with it. And this is basically what I mean with mixed reality. So now is the question, what is walkable film? What, what is mixed reality? Um, what do we have to do with it? And what are the best practices and the learnings that we did um, with Porsche on this journey? So these are the questions that I want to tackle in the next couple of minutes. First off, just really quick, um, a, compar um, yeah, a comparison of physical reality and digital reality so that we are knowing which, which um, are we in right now. So right now we are in the physical reality. Everyone knows that. It's there since the beginning of time. The chair you're sitting on is physical reality, the person next to you, and all the other physical entities right here. Although the microphone is. In the last years, we gathered a lot of data. Big data is one keyword there. Um, we're working with virtual reality. We work basically every day with this little device, and this is basically digital reality. So we're showing additional information. Also, for example, um, if you're at the train station and you watch on the schedule, it's all digital. This is digital information. And for me or for us, mixed reality is basically just putting them together. Maybe you can remember uh, the day where you printed out your Google Maps to find the way to your specific location where you want to go to. Right now, you wouldn't do that anymore. You would take your smartphone at the point of need and would the smartphone let guide you onto the location where you want to go at the specific time. So this is also kind of mixed reality. So this is not only like a future talk, but we are actually there at the moment. Mixed reality can be a lot of different stuff. It could also be, for example, you're scanning a QR code, getting additional information via an AR experience. So there's a lot um, to do with that. Also Alexa. Most of you think I know Amazon Alexa, where you just talk and order stuff via a voice commands. So we are in an age where the computer leaves the two-dimensional screen that it's attached to. So it's getting more and more out of the 2D and more into our reality. This can be like virtual reality, even if there are still screens, but we see a depth of field. Um, but also augmented reality or mixed reality focuses on bringing you this um, feeling of you are in the reality, you're doing something naturally with digital information. Just for a second, imagine like the HoloLens or the HTC Vive or the Oculus Rift would be just the size of your normal glasses. Then you would use them the whole day, basically, because you can just take a picture by blinking or stuff like that. Google Glasses already tried that, not at the right time, um, but this is where everything is headed. So with all that information, we just thought there, there has to be a use case that we can utilize to show this future and, and to work on, on this um, topic. 
And for that, we wanted to use volumetric video, so walkable film, that you can be part of a movie and walking through the movie and watch it from every angle. So I could now explain how this is working, how the recording is working, the technicalities, but I think I will let the guys from Microsoft explain it because they are more accurate and they will do it a lot faster than me uh, in my not native language. So uh, it's just two minutes and then I will speak again. I hope so. In this video, we present our system to create high quality, free viewpoint video that can be compressed to bandwidth suitable for consumer applications. This example is a traditional Maori Haka performance. We start by capturing performances with 106 synchronized RGB and infrared cameras on a calibrated green screen stage. We subtract the background to compute silhouettes, then schedule the data for processing. The first step generates a 3D point cloud starting with stereo depth maps from RGB and IR pairs. Points from these depth maps are merged and refined locally. Then the cloud is refined globally using a multi-view stereo algorithm. This result has over 2.7 million points with normals per frame. We're viewing tens of thousands of points in this scene. The next stage creates a watertight mesh per frame. We modify screen poisson surface reconstruction to produce meshes constrained by the silhouettes. These meshes typically have topological artifacts and spurious components. To clean them up, we apply topological denoising and island removal. This result has over 1 million triangles per frame. Next, we determine which areas contain perceptually important details such as hands or faces. We preserve the quality of geometry and texture in these areas when we decimate the mesh to its target density. This example is reduced to 20,000 triangles per frame. We then establish temporal coherence by choosing mesh keyframes and deforming them to fit ranges of the performance. This coherence is critical for compressing mesh motion and textures. This example was split into four subsequences. The final step is to unwrap the meshes, generate a texture atlas, then compress and encode the data in a single streamable MPEG file at our target bitrate. This example is running at 12 megabits per second. Let's take a look at some example captures from our system. So, I think all of you now just got a pretty good idea how that's actually working. I will go more into detail of the process and especially the journey with um, Porsche in just a couple of seconds. So how do we get to this technology? So we didn't invite it uh, or, or we didn't invent it ourselves or stumbled across it. We actually got an email from the special effects guy who made the special effects for um, example, Independence Day, White House Down, Air Force One. And he sent us a link to a video like that which showed us the technology. And in this video, um, which he sent us, where a little name mentioned, like Microsoft Research. So we thought, hey, we are one of their partners. Maybe we should give them a call. And a week later, we had the um, head of Volumetric Studio, Stephen Sullivan, uh, call us. And just talking through with us about the different possibilities that they are. And we were so excited about it that we just thought, okay, we schedule a uh, meeting there in early Dece December 2016 and fly over there for three days, make a capture and try to do something with it. So with that information, we still had the problem of the customer. So who would pay for that all? Who wants to make a volumetric video um, just, just for fun, basically? Um, at that moment, Metropolis VR, um, which we co-founded, spoke at that specific point with Porsche about AR, VR um, experiences, how they could utilize it, and especially Porsche wanted to make their museum way more interesting. They wanted to um, have, like, uh, have like an interesting guide or um, special VR effects or something. They wasn't sure what it should be, but they wanted to do something. So we just thought, hey, let's make a virtual guide. Have, for example, the design chef of the Porsche explaining the Porsche to you in the museum, live when you're walking through it. You could actually fly the uh, Porsche design chef there, chief there, and um, have him explain it directly to you. 
but that would be way too expensive to have it for three, four, five years. So um, to have them there all the time. This was the moment where we flew with him there to Redmond. And um, I just want to give you a quick overview how those recordings work and what you're actually doing. So you are there for three days. You travel there, and the first day, um, you basically feel like vacation. You're walking around, you have the wow effect, you see the studio and think, oh, that's so great. Then they show you the coffee, the coffee maker, also great. And then you start to, to record the first test stuff. And in the, this is the latest moment where you realize that you have to make your storyboard different, that you have to adjust your concept, because first off, you know how many space you have. It, it's written down somewhere, but if you're actually there, you can maybe see those white lines on, on the ground there. The outer line is like, in the, uh, uh, is like 2.2 2 .2 meters or so. So this is the space in which you can record. So we wanted him to walk around the whole car. The car is 4.5 meters long. So first issue there, how do we record him? How do we accommodate this uh, challenge? So you're making adjustments at the first day to the script that it's working somehow. We'll explain to you which adjustments in just a couple of seconds. So um, on the second day, you do a lot of filming. So you basically film till you drop. While you have only three days, so on the second day you do a lot of filming and then you think on the third day you just review it and take a couple of shots again, right? But because of those over 100 cameras who will film you from every angle, overnight it can only process so much. So you have maybe four, five, six clips that you can look at and then you have to record on a whim uh, what you might need on the, on the third day. And then you fly back and hope for the best that you have everything in place. So, what can you actually do in, in those uh, environments? So this is um, an actual photo from the head of design uh, from Porsche who, who stood there. First things first, we want him to explain a car. So how does he know where the height of the car is, where the booth of the car is? You need to use, for example, props like this. So you have two props and then he can just move with, a with his hand over those props and you know, okay, this is the height of the car, this is the booth of the car and so on. First learning, use three props, because afterwards we weren't sure where to put the car, because we only had two props and then we have to adjust the car perfectly to match him. So this was one issue that, that we encountered. Um, the other thing is, if you're starting to, to record him, um, you see him there in a virtual environment, uh, what do you do to make him look into the eye of the person who is visiting the museum? So to the, to the visitor, it's kind of rude if I would start the presentation like this. Hello and welcome, my name is Marcus Ritter. You, you wouldn't like that. So you need him to watch at the audience and start his presentation this way. For example, we use the light column where the user in the actual museum has to step in and then the presentation starts. In this moment, he is looking me into the eye at the actual museum. Then I'm able to walk around, and then it's no problem that he's no longer looking at me because it's my decision to move around. So it's, it's not feeling rude in this moment. And also, how do you... So in the Porsche Museum, it's basically like you're having the HoloLens on your head so you can look through. You're walking through the museum, and how do you make someone um, yeah, notice that you have a presentation there, that you have someone explaining the car? So you need also to include audio. So if you want to do volumetric video, 3D video, and all that kind of stuff, always think about audio and spatial audio. So drive the user with audio. We have a little sound when he appears, like Princess and Leia in Star Wars, basically, and this sound lets the user or the visitor um, see, okay, now he's appearing, he is like beaming into the room, and then he starts explaining the car. Then we have him disappear, and you hear the sound again when he reappears somewhere else. And then you look at the front, see him there, presenting the car again. So we also worked around the issue with the only 2.2 2 uh, 2 .2 meter um, radius that we had, or uh, di diameter that we had. So we just recorded him twice, once in front of the car and on the side of the car. Actually, we recorded him way more often, but those are the two um, most, most important. 
So this is basically the installation then in the Porsche Museum, bless you. Um, this is the installation then in the Porsche Museum where you see him walking around the car and you are also able to walk around the car. Next issue that you have to encounter when you work with stuff like that. There is a real car in your device that you have on your head. You, mu you must somehow track that there is a car. So if the visitor is going like this, he is only, he is only able to see the head of um, the head of design and not the whole um, person blending through the car. So you have to also think about that. Um, it's a lot of um, app programming, concepting that, that goes into, um, into that logic. Uh, with, with Porsche, we had a very, very great and prepared customer. So, so they were so amazed by the mixed reality technology and HoloLens technology that they actually just rented a film crew, go, uh, went to their museum, and just before we went to Redmond, they pre-recorded everything they wanted to do in 2D so that you have a really good idea how the actual movie in the end should look like. So that's a pretty big commitment just, just for fun to, to have a whole film crew recording, uh, recording it um, before. Um, yeah, as I already said, you, you have to change the script, especially for volumetric video, um, because of restrictions. For example, in Redmond, you have four minutes of uh, time that you can record in one shot and then you need to make a break. So you have to have speaking parts which are not longer than four minutes. Um, for me, that would be impossible. I always need more time to talk. Um, and rendering, rendering, rendering. So there is really, really a lot rendering. Um, I try to just go fast through the different stuff so that we can make up some time. Um, this is a recording from the development uh, edition. So there we can see him um, with a virtual car. In the Porsche Museum, there is no virtual car, there is the real car. Um, but this helps if you want to present those use cases somewhere else. So if you go with your HoloLens somewhere else, you can just um, show the virtual car and show it as a demonstration. So that's also pretty, um, pretty good. And we, we couldn't record the whole car at once because it was too big, so we recorded the first part of the car and the back part of the car and then merged it together so we had a complete car. So. There is some stuff to, to think about. There are also different technologies. I don't only want to, to push like, yeah, Microsoft are the only ones who can do that. There are lots of different companies who, who try their best in volumetric video. One of, for example, um, is uh, Fraunhofer. They're building their own kind of volumetric studio. Um, it's like a, a, a light rotunda. So you're standing there. Um, surrounded by a lot of light and um, you have less cameras but also still um, you see it there two terabyte of data every recording minute so that's basically the edge of the physical pos physically possible stuff that you can record so um, this technology also will shrink down the data um, in the next uh, month and years UFA is already producing stuff with that and it's testing it out just to give you an idea of how it looks like from the inside, so it's basically like you're now knocking on the doors of heaven and hell, and you, it will be decided where you go. So you sit there in the room full of light, evading your judgment. So this is what it looks like from the inside. There are also way cheaper solutions um, if you just want to, to get into the business and just want to, to look at it. It's um, a double me, they do holoportation. That's also quite interesting. It's like you record you and you will be processed in real time and you will be shown somewhere else in real time, which you can't do with two terabytes uh, of data a minute. So you need a, loss, um, a lot less um, high resolution to, to do that. And they are basically doing it with just a few cameras um, with a gaming PC from, from, from power perspective and then you're able to, to do that. It's, it's not as high resolution um, as, for example, vol volumetric video in real, but um, Maybe it also does the trick. So now my last slide and then um, you, you're through. I want just to, to talk a little bit about the Media Tech Hub. So um, we are also part of the Media Tech Hub and um, we are trying to get all those technologies and all those new ways of communication into um, Germany and especially into uh, Potsdam. Um, so we have the film studio here which is the 
one of the biggest film studios worldwide, um, a lot of tech companies, so, so there is the experience. And um, we are actually working right now um, on different ways of, of uh, um, getting something done like this here. Uh, can't talk too much right now, um, but I suppose um, early next year um, there would be, will be more information. Um, if you want to talk to me, if you have questions, uh, feel free to come up to me um, outside. I'm not sure how's my time, but um, yeah. Anyways, thank you very much. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, yeah. Thank you so much.